is Two Minutes About Time with Luke Allen and Robert E. G. Black, the podcast that takes a look at the film About Time, two minutes at a time. I'm Richard Curtis, and I hope you enjoy it. And if you don't, well, you can just travel back in time two minutes and listen to something else. I'm on your host, Luke Allen. I'm joined, as always, with my co-host, Robert E. G. Black. Hello. And our special guest for this week, Brian. Hey, how's it going? I realise I haven't said your surname at all this week. <laughs> Brian Lockhart. No, you know, I answered anything at this point, honestly. It's only because I realised I give me and Robert full names. And I think I did it first time because I forgot to double check your surname and I get really paranoid. <laughs> and then I just forgot otherwise. So yeah, to the listeners, whenever you hear me refer to a guest by their first names, because I'm scared that I've forgotten their surname. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes there's even, I think when we had James on, there was even a pause where I forgot his first name. <laughs> we were on the call and I was like, join with special guest James. <laughs> anyway. Oh, we are the worst when it comes to introductions. And it could be just my uh, co-host and I who've been friends for 25 years. And we will never consist- consistently call each other what we, <laughs> you know, either do we use first names, last names, who goes first, who goes second. We are, you, you think halfway through a movie we would have figured this out by now but it is what it is but incidentally if you're graham curry we do remember your name <laughs> it's the only one anyway um robert something interesting to you happened between these episodes well apparently uh the first message was actually earlier when i was doing my notes it wasn't even when i was talking which is weirder but yeah i got a te- a message from goodness cakes of i don't know <laughs> walthamstow walthamstow london I'm British and I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, uh, because I guess I said, where are you located? <laughs> or said something about where they were located. And so it looks, from the screen that I showed you two, it looks as if I texted them and said, where are you located? But I didn't. At that time, I was typing notes in Word. I was not on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> and so I got a response just a, little, a few minutes ago. It says, hi there, I'm in Walthamstow, London. Okay. Don't worry. It's not creepy at Thank all. Thank you. <laughs> so, hang on. So, if, if since it only just happened then, then maybe they are, um, maybe there is is a real person replying. Yeah, yeah. Have you asked them? Were you in about time? Well, no. It's whoever's probably managing their thing right now. They don't have nothing, anything to do with it. They might know they, if they're. They might be like, in lots of movies. The little, just some little shop. It's just. It's just weird. So we open 105 with my favourite note of the entire film, maybe. Um, So Donal said on the commentary, this was his first shooting day, and they were like, okay, you're sad. And Richard Curtis said while they were filming, he said, just lean over and kiss her. So he leant over, passionately kissed Rachel McAdams, and then Richard Curtis said, no, I mean your daughter. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, it's an honest mistake. Ah, That's funny. Really like that. And Donald said he was just annoyed that Richard Curtis said it loudly to the entire crew. <laughs> <laughs> so we open with uh, Mary saying, you okay? And we get Nick Caves into my arms playing, which is just yeah. the first time I listened to the soundtrack CD, I literally teared up at this song. Like, Well, this song is in, I mean, this is like your favorite movie. One of my top like five zero effect, this song features at the end of the movie. And so. This one, yeah, got my attention. It was also in um, Ricky Gervais' Afterlife. Oh. I don't know if either of you watched Afterlife. I haven't watched that, but I know what it is, yeah. I recommend it. Some people have problems with it, but they're people who expect just comedy from Ricky Gervais. Right. So, although some bits in it, uh, you, it's like an awkward balance where he's trying to be funny and crass in places, but often heartfelt in others, and it's like you could cut out the random and pointless crude humour from it and just have a nice thing. Um so then Hallway. Yeah, hallway. Sorry, I was just getting a message through while I was talking. So in the hallway and oh Was it goodness cakes? <laughs> oh Graham Curry. <laughs> anyway. So uh Nick Cave doesn't believe in an interventionist God, but knows that his darling does. Well he might. The singer is not necessarily the narrator of the song. <laughs> <laughs> Hey Siri, does Nick Cave believe in an interventionist ah! god? <laughs> okay, I found this on the web for does Nick Cave believe in an interventionist god? Check it out. Of course it's just links to the song. Yeah. I don't know what I was expecting <laughs> to come up. An interview in which Nick Cave explains. A genius article somewhere. 
he'll text you later, just like goodness cakes does. <laughs> Cave will just message me. It'll just be a text from Nick Cave that says, "I don't believe in intervention. An intervention is God, but I know, darling, that you do." And I'd say, "Wow, you listen to the show." When asked in 2009 about whether he believed in a personal God, Cave's reply was no. The following year, he stated, "I'm not religious. I'm not a Christian, but I do reserve the right to believe in the possibility of a God." There we go. But Nick Cave has also said that he's an atheist. Um, talks, yeah, he seems to be a pretty open atheist. I mean, I imagine you would be when you're. I believe most well-known song opens with "I don't believe in an interventionist God." <laughs> I don't know, but like you don't know when you're writing it that it's going to be your most well-known. Is it his most well-known song? I don't think this is his most well-known song. Yeah, I don't know any other Nick Cave. Songs. I don't know though because I know weirdly I know obscure songs of his more than his well-known ones. So I don't know what his well-known ones are. He had a great song on the X Files uh, soundtrack that was a secret zero track. You had to go backward to get to it. <laughs> Oh wow! I didn't know you and could do was, that. It, well, right. That it, the note on the jacket said, "Like Nick Cave would like you to know that zero is also a number," and you had to figure out what that meant, and then figure out you could rewind as track one started. That but it was, was a awesome. nine-minute track, so you had to sit there rewinding for a long time. I I forget when C. I, that was the beauty of having CDs and stuff back in the day. I, I forget what album I had, but there was one. I, 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 I'm not sure if it was Guns N' Roses, like Spaghetti Incident or something like that, but it was like 30 minutes into the la- after the last song, a hidden track popped up. <laughs> and the only reason I even discovered it was because I was in the middle of doing something while the CD ended and it just kept playing. And all of a sudden a hidden track came up and it was like 30 minutes <laughs> into it. What's, uh, Tool does that where the, it, track 69 is a secret song. <laughs> nice. But each of those tracks in between are like a few seconds long and so. It's just this long bit of silence. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, you can't do that. Or they don't do that with, um, you know, digital technology. That's that's the uh, – that, I miss those The thing days. is my, my <laughs> CD players tell you the number the, the, the number of tracks. Like that's normal, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you've got like one where it's got 69 tracks or whatever, like you'd notice, wouldn't you? Well, no, the, I don't think then it would have told you – how many tracks total until you were at that track? It tells you what track you're on. Oh, when I put my, like, I, I've got my CD player sent to me when you put the track in before you click play, it tells you the number of tracks there are on the oh, okay. thing. So, yeah. Anyway, we've talked about Nick Cave and his faith. <laughs> um, now we're on to, uh, the, the shot, yeah, of them going down the stairs. And, oh. So we open with, with Desmond. Before you moved on, I was going to tell you the title of that secret track because it's weirdly in Latin, but. It's so long. I, I, well, well, Robert, you can put it in the description. <laughs> <laughs> you can say, you know, we, we're, we're joined by Brian to talk about and just that and nothing else. Just that, <laughs> that Latin that phrase. Is, that, the reason I brought that song up though is because you were talking about him being an atheist and that song is definitely about, it's about Jesus, hmm. but not from a perspective necessarily of a religious person. It's about Jesus not returning. So it's, so, we see Desmond walking down the stairs. Yeah. Um, it's just Desmond being so serious again. And I like how they all, well, check themselves in the mirror, or a lot of them do. Desmond going down the stairs, we then cut to Jay and Kit Kat embracing and going down the stairs. Which is, I think, the first time in this timeline that we've seen Jay and Kit Kat together. Yeah. And, uh, they don't look in the mirror. Mary walks, looks in the mirror. It's, it's weird. The way I see, it's weird how I've looked at this sometimes. Where I've almost thought, is Mary going, am I crying enough? <laughs> let me, let me check, I look sad enough. Uh, I know that's not what they're doing, but it's always like, the first thought that comes to my head is they're checking that they look sad enough. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, uh. Well, no, Desmond straightens his tie, it's his is specific. Yeah, he, he's the, you know, he's always impeccably dressed, so he's yep. making sure that he, they just, you know, had a heartfelt moment of upstairs. I'm sure he was a little un, you know, uh, disheveled, and everybody's fixing themselves before they move on to the next and, thing that they're going to be doing. Yeah, you know? we'll see more later. But I would note at this point, you can—it actually looks like Kit Kat is wearing black. Yeah, and not purple. Although we'll find out that when you see her legs later, she is wearing purple leggings with the arc but. of um of Donald's hair. <laughs> it's all right this minute. Huh? Tim's Tim's hair. I, mean, I don't know how different it is, but it just stood out to me more this minute. I guess he combed it to go with the suit. 
it reminds me more of General Hux, you know, ah. hairstyle than than before. You know, like it just the way it's combed seems darker red. You know, <laughs> it's definitely neater. So yeah, he walks down, straightens his well, not straightens his watch, puts his watch on. Um, I don't know how you straighten a watch. I don't know why I was going to say that. Um, and then and then the mum walks past, and I like how she doesn't look into the mirror at all. And she is definitely, like, you know how, you know the line earlier on where she says that she's hecking furious? Yeah. Yeah. You can, you can sense that in her here, right? There is that, like, there is that anger behind the sadness as in the, in the way that oh, she Oh yeah, walks. she's like marching down the stairs, or, or not down the stairs, the hallway. She's all busy. And she stops and, she, she stops and collects herself before she goes in the room. The drawing room with everyone else. Oh no, we've got the line at the end of this minute. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so mum says, right, are we ready for this? And, uh, Harry says, of course we're not. Hateful day. Whew. <laughs> it's, it's just the way he delivers it. Like, um, Tom Hollander was commenting on the commentary about how he, how he didn't like the way he delivered that line because it felt out of character, but that's the point. Oh, that's, that's why it works. Oh, I... If he says something nice, it, he means it. Yeah. Incidentally, I forgot to say, um, in terms of Nick Cage, if he did, he'd kneel down and ask him. But we don't know what until Monday. Did you say Nick Cage? Yeah. Nick Cave. I definitely said I, Nick Cave, I think. I, I, I heard Nick Cage, too. I was waiting. I'm like, well, how does Nick Cage factor into this, and what version did I miss? Oh, well, Nick, Nick, Nick Cage does appear in this movie as a strange painting of him in the table tennis room. <laughs> On the floor in the table tennis room is a portrait of a man who looks a heck of a lot like Nick Cage. Ah, okay. I didn't notice that. <laughs> it was commented on on the commentary. I didn't notice it myself. Since recording this episode, we had a chat with set decorator Liz Griffiths once again about this painting, as we completely forgot to mention it in our bonus episode with her and JP. So uh, here's what she had to say. So, Liz, we've been talking for a while on the show about a painting that looks an awful lot like Nick Cage. Could you tell us what what on earth the story is behind that? Gosh, I know. I I find that it's I can't remember getting a picture of a, or a painting that that was Nick Cage. The only thing I can think that it could be is in Porthpian House. There's an old um, storage place which we converted into a table tennis table, and they had a table tennis tournament. And we put lots of interesting pictures around there. There was a fabulous rabbit from a friend of mine called Georgina Day Calm that painted that's behind one of the players' heads, and then propped up behind Bill on the floor is this framed portrait. I think this must be the one that you're talking about. And that, I I think I hired it from a, a props hire company, and I think it was called From Eccentric Trading, which is a, a fabulous antiques emporium. I think it was from there. It could have been somewhere else without going through the orders. I can't exactly remember. But unless it was made for a film that Nick Cage was in and it was an artist's impression <laughs> and it ended up in back in the higher land, I mean, it, it could, that's a potential. But I never saw the likeness. We just know it in the industry as the kind of 30s guy sitting in the, in the leather club chair. That's kind of what we know that picture as. So I don't know it as um, Nick Cage, unfortunately. So do you often, <laughs> when you're making stuff, genuinely just spot? Just like if you're watching a film, do you often think, oh, yeah, I know that prop? Oh, <laughs> beyond. My partner, Graham, you know, we have to have a kind of, don't mention it, don't mention it, because I could literally watch most films, most Agatha Christie afternoon shows, most dramas that are on, and I could sit there completely talking about that blue enamel tin, <laughs> tin comes from Stuart Lim. I can't believe they've used that chest of drawers. That always gets used. That's really <laughs> obvious. That sofa, I thought they've recovered it, but they've not recurved, recovered it quite badly. I can't believe it. And oh, and they've got the matching um, curtains from Seasons Textiles. So I literally have got a photographic memory of all these things because I've been doing it for so long. So I, we know all the props houses and where stuff comes from. So it's always really refreshing to see things that you go, oh, they've they bought that or, you know. So a lot of my stuff I, I tend to buy or search or find something a bit different just in case I, I'd have someone else sitting there go, I can't believe you just hired that in from somewhere <laughs> obvious. So, yeah, I mean, what what are our, our thoughts on 105 before we go to our bonus minute? 
just just for nice things, I would mention Kit Kat's barefoot. <laughs> and Desmond is smiling. <laughs> yeah, he is. <laughs> I, I I would just say that, you know, I watched the movie, the minute, the, the whole movie, I mean, and of course, sad because of the way the movie plays out. And, but it's, you know, as I was watching these minutes over and over again, I'm like, this friggin' minute got me every single time, you know, like emotionally, like it's, it didn't, leading up to it, all these other ones, fine, no, no problem, that, it's just something, and, and not even having the context of the rest of the movie, you know, with the relationship of him and his father, to, to, to like, be fresh in my mind, literally just watching that one minute, but, but knowing the movie, just only watching it a few weeks ago, it's very sad, it's very well done. It's Nick Cave and Harry that make it, really. Yeah. I, that's yeah. the thing. I actually, I actually wrote down for in my notes, hateful minute. <laughs> I mean, it's a great minute, but I mean, like, it's, it's sad. Like, it's, this is a nice heartwarming story about family. And there's a lot of comedy as, as we mentioned early on, but this, this is where it gets a little, you know, heavy, real heavy. And I was like, man, it, it all, it's effective. <laughs> it's a good minute, but yeah, it's, it's also a hateful hate, minute. Hateful's an interesting choice of what A, hateful minute, it'll be a good title for today's episode. <laughs> B, hateful with how Harry is and how he's so fueled with hate for everything. Hateful's such a great word for him to use. Yeah, I love the line. I think it's perfect as far as describing of, it's better, you know, I'll, I'll use my one swear word that you can beep. It's, it's, it's more elegant than saying shitty day. You know, this yeah. is a, sh and, and he's, you know, you can use that in mixed company. Everybody knows what he's talking about. Yep. Uh, everybody feels that. And, and he's the one to vocalize it in that, you know, he's, he's, cause he's a curmudgeon, uh, but it's perfect. And he's a writer. And yeah. it's the first point. He's, he's acknowledged emotion and weakness. Yeah. He's acknowledged that we're not ready. And yeah. I think also it's worth noting that there's quite a lot of boats behind them. Yeah. And we'll see. Lots of sunny day. Yeah. I, and, I don't. Wait. It also should be winter, I think. Well, it's Britain. I'm trying like, to do math. Um, we can have sunny days in winter. It's <laughs> weird in Britain. Actually, it's like I, fall. I didn't know Britain had sunny days at all. I thought it was just always rainy. Oh, oh, twice a year. Almost, we're almost up to the year of the movie. <laughs> it should be about 2012 now, ish. So, hateful minute. Any final comments before we go to our bonus minute? No. <laughs> So I forgot what bonus minute I sent you, Brian, as I always do with all our guests. <laughs> That's what this segment is called. It was minute two, the very beginning. Ah, first introduction of the dad. Yeah, the mom and the dad. Oh. This is where he describes the mom's fashion icon was the queen. Uh, you know how I, I I like his description of her. Yeah, so it's basically an introduction of his family. The you know minute two. So well, you know, since I didn't get any minutes with with the dad. I'll say Bill Nye is so charming. <laughs> I'm going to use, keep using that word. I'm going to beat it to death. But he is, he's just so great as the dad, you know, in this, in, in this movie a, a, as a whole. And I do like how in this particular minute, when, when Dommel's, uh, or Tim is narrating about his dad, he said he, he always seemed to have, you know, time on his hands and he was eternally available for a chat or ping pong. And knowing, you know, that, yeah, he's been time Eternally. traveling. This, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it makes sense. It's such a good turn of phrase and, and a well-written little thing. Like, if you don't know this movie's about time travel or that Tim's going to suddenly get the same power as his dad, or maybe you just saw the trailer and think only Tim can time travel, whatever. It's just that little bit of dialogue. It's kind of like, oh, once you realize <laughs> what, what was written, you're like, oh, yeah, he, he, it's because he is eternally time traveling back and forth and making himself available for, you know, plus knowing what was going to happen to him. He was, he made himself available to his family and him and his son were very close. And Bill Nye is awesome in this. I mean, he's just, he's great. You can't see it clearly, but the painting of Nick Cage is behind them in this minute. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was wondering if it was there. It's more clear in, in other parts of the film. So, Brian, if you could go back in time to any point in your life to either relive it or change something about it, what moment in your life would you choose? Okay, so I was thinking about this because I knew this was going to be a question. And, 
you know, my initial thought was, oh, I'll just go back in time to when I was like 18 and join the Marine Corps. And it was like, and tell myself or, or not, not tell myself because I would be myself and just try to be a little more serious about things. <laughs> it's kind of a, you know, goof, but I was like, that's, that's just like an easy answer. And I was really trying to think. So I don't know if people will see my name, but my name is, is Brian, but it's B R Y O N. And that is always my whole life been called, I've been called Byron because uh, people look at it and they see it, you know, they see the opposite. I've had, I have official documents with the wrong name on it. Uh, my, <laughs> at work, my, my review often has my, <laughs> my wrong name on it, even though my boss knows my name, you know, just stuff like that. So I was. Is thinking, it even an autocorrect thing as well though? Yeah. Well, maybe. I mean, there are, I've met other Brian's, B-R-Y-O-N, but doesn't matter. People say Byron or, or whatever. I, I don't get any issues when I type it in as an autocorrect, but I started thinking about it. I'm like, okay, so if I go back, what are the rules of time travel? If I go back in time, I can only go back in time to myself. So mm-hmm. could I go back in time as a, as an infant before my parents were able to sign the I was hoping that's where you were going. Yeah. <laughs> so I would be aware and alert, but I was thinking about it. I'm like, I don't think I have any control of my body at that point to be able to prevent them from like like if i went back as a baby or to formulate the words brian has an a in it something like yeah that. right like yeah like exactly something like don't be hippies and <laughs> not that my parents were <laughs> but don't do something crazy and, and name your kid something in, weird in, 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 in finger paints you just you yeah. just write out my name's brian <laughs> right exactly but so i'm like but I, even if i had the intelligence i don't think i would have the motor skills to be able to convey that to my parents so then i had to think can I go even further back? And not to get into a whole theological thing or, or uh, you know, a debate, but could I go into the womb? So at what well, point? Well, he does in butterfly effect. Exactly. So, all right. So could I go into the womb? And then anytime I, if I could hear, anytime my parents having a discussion about what to name the baby, it could kick my mom's womb. <laughs> you know, like, it, so like that they. really likes this other name. Hmm. Yeah, so that, or I, I was going to say, if, if I kicked it every time they said Brian, and yeah, we're going to spell it with an O, and I kick, would they, but would they miss it? <laughs> no, they think you're really excited about exactly, the game. Exactly, exactly. It was like, oh, we got to do it. So would, so now would I seal my own fate? Like, <laughs> I went back in time and I, I made it. In fact, maybe I already did it somehow that. Somehow gets worse. Right, my name was maybe already, some, probably was. It's now, it's now Brian with a silent Q. Exactly. <laughs> I either really messed it up, or I caused it to be B R Y O N. So that's what I would do. I would try to correct the uh, spelling yes. of my name. That is one of my favorite answers we've had. That is, yeah. yeah, I think I've said that with almost every guest as well. Yeah. It just oh, it's good. the stakes keep getting good. higher and higher. We've never done go back in time to the womb before. Well, I'm happy to happy to hear I could add something new to the show. Then, <laughs> incidentally, considering the film, it was only two weeks ago that we had a guest say I wouldn't go back in time. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'd imagine that would have happened earlier on. We had two guests in a row say it, but we had, yeah. Yeah, it's like the Garth Brooks song. You know, I if if I only knew what was going to happen, I might have missed the dance, <laughs> you know, or whatever the whatever it's called. Like, if if I knew how it would end, I may have changed things, So, but I would have missed the dance to get there, you know, so. So, Brian, or Byron, <laughs> uh, where, where can our listeners find you on social media? Just, we are on the Marine Corps Movie Minute. Actually, let's do this. Marine Corps Movie Minute at gmail.com if anybody wants to reach out to us via email. And we are on Instagram at the Marine Corps Movie Minute Pod and Twitter at MCMM underscore podcast. And then our pod being site for Marine Corps Movie Minute for if you want to listen to the show. Okay. And Robert, where can they find you? Robert E.G. Black on social media or lemmingdrops.com. Most can find me on Twitter at Lerma underscore Battle Zero, Instagram at Ginger Luke, Facebook Luke Allen Film, all podcasts, radio appearance, new paper articles, short films, all available at Luke Allen UK. These shows on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Two Minutes About Time, also on IMDb at Two Minutes About Time. They can join our Facebook group for cover to discuss all things to do with About Time and anything else. <sighs> that was and good. according to this website, All Right Then is a way of saying goodbye, apparently. So, all right then. The Two Minutes About Time theme is performed by Ethan O'Mahony and is a cover of the About Time theme originally composed by Nick Laird Close. Two Minutes About Time is a production of Lemming Drop Studios in association with Bottle O Productions. Mm-hmm.